Hi everyone, thanks for coming to our very first um, guest lunch seminar of the fall semester 2014. Um, I'm Angela Kong, I'm one of the new um, co-organizers of the lunch seminar. Um, my other co-organizers are Mike Wei and Bastian. You can pronounce your last name. Uh, <laughs> um, so thanks for um, showing up. We have a great turnout. And uh, we're very excited to hear um, our director, um, Gavin Schmidt, give us you know, uh, the first seminar to kick off the series. So we're very excited about that. Thanks, Gavin. And uh, um, I don't think we have a for us. But so without further ado, Gavin. Fine. So do you want me to speak into any of these mics? Or does that matter? Um, so it, it, it's finally happened. It is. So for, for years, you know, I, I spent a lot of time you know, worrying about presentations and, uh, you know, putting presentations together and, you know, thinking very deeply about the slides and, uh, and increasingly about the images and, like, now worrying about there's too much text and uh, trying to have something that kind of flows and that doesn't distract <laughs> from the person speaking. I spent a lot of time thinking about the presentation. I, increasingly, though, I, I, I spent time... Uh, thinking about when I'm going to have time to put together a presentation. <laughs> and that time seems to be shrinking uh, on, on, on a regular basis. And so it has finally happened that I have been scheduled to give a talk for which I have done no preparation whatsoever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I, I uh, well, this morning, I, you, you should have seen this. We had, like, I, we had a meeting at 10 o'clock. Only I got a call, and I was supposed to be giving a talk at the Alliance Francaise uh, at 9 o'clock. And so I had, to, I had to rush and give a talk that I gave last year, uh, again, with no preparation. So, so this, is, this is totally the singularity in terms of uh, my ability to, uh, to come up with stuff just off the top of my head. So I'm going to take this as a challenge. <laughs> There is a chalkboard. Oh, we could go. We could go back to the old school. I don't know. That's good. Um, so I, I should be able to do this. <laughs> um, um, um. Okay. Now, what I, so what I want to talk about is uh, kind of where we're going. Not not as an institute so much, but as a but as a modeling group. Um, I'm the PI on the, on the main model development proposal. Uh, we've just got that reauthorized. It was like a two year process to get it reorganized, but we've got another three years before we have to have a big uh, proposal uh, done again. Um, and just this week, I was writing a letter answering some questions that the program managers had on where we see ourselves and why do we exist? What is it that we bring to the table that other groups don't? Or, or, or do we bring anything actually interesting to the table that other groups don't? And so I've been thinking, uh, not, not very deeply, but, but somewhat deeply about this as an issue. And I think that there are some things that we do that do make us uh, special and that do mark us out and that do justify our continued existence, uh, which I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> so I, I, I think we need, in, in looking forward, I think it's always useful to look back. And if we look back and we try and see where the, the modeling effort that we have developed came from, uh, it, it came from a number of different elements. Um, a lot of the work that was done on uh, scattering by aerosols, on radiative transfer, was done in support of the Pioneer missions, or the Mariner missions, or the Voyager missions, which uh, people here had instruments on. Uh, GIS as a whole started off as a theoretical um, physics division of NASA to do 
the theory that other engineers could then build and, and, and work on. Now, there's lots of theory that gets done in other parts of NASA now, and there's obviously lots of relevant climate stuff that gets done in other uh, agencies and other groups around the world. But one of the things that's kind of marked out GISS's role has, has always been that big picture, right? You know, when we started doing radiator transfer, when we started doing uh, aerosol modeling, the questions were, you know, what, what was, what's the rest of the solar system like? Why is Venus so hot? Why is Earth so nice? And why is big Mars so cold? And those are still kind of big questions. We know in detail much more about why that is. But we're still interested in the history of the solar system that put us in this position. And that same kind of big picture thinking really, I think, has, has driven a lot of the modeling that we've done, like going back to uh, you know the, the nine layer, eight by 10, or even 12 by 15 uh, model that, uh, that, that Andy and, and Gary and Jim and David and people put together way back in the day. The issue was not, can we model every single thing in the system perfectly? The issue was, can we model the system and try and understand the emerging properties of that system without having to know every single little detail about everything that's going on? And the fact that we're still doing this almost 40 years later indicates that either we're really very good uh, uh, at fooling people <laughs> or we actually have learned something about the system and about this emergent properties without having to know every single de little detail about the system. And I think that that's actually a very powerful uh, conclusion. What we're doing in terms of general circulation modeling is useful and does teach us about the real world despite the fact that the models, if you drill down into them, are always wrong in some absolutely fundamental, crucial aspect uh, or another. So, now there are, there are other groups that have climate models. Right? So, NCAR <coughs> has uh, a climate model that's about twice the size of ours in terms of functional lines of code. The Hadley Center has something similar. GFDL, um, the Norwegians, the French, the Germans. Uh, uh, I think there's roughly 22 functioning groups who build GCM class uh, models uh, around the world. Why then do we need ours? And we don't often think about that, right? We, you know, we're, we're happy to, to have a job, we're happy to get a grant funded, we're happy to get a graduate student, we're happy to, to write a paper, but like, how often do we really think about that really existential question. Why are we here and, and for what reason? What are we adding to, uh, to that situation? You know, above like what any of our individual uh, contributions, obviously, because we're all brilliant and intelligent people who would do well anywhere. What is it unique about this institution, this, this group of people, or this, this culture uh, that makes it worth keeping? So, I think to, to illustrate that, I, it, it's worth like just going over a little bit of my personal history. Um, I, uh, I was a mathematician uh, who didn't work on anything related to climate, um, uh, really for, for my PhD. Uh, my PhD was all about wave mean flow interaction on rotating stratified flow, which has some vague connection to the ocean, but, but really uh, is not very ocean-like. Um, and I was, I was looking for a job, uh, and it turns out that knowing something about wave mean flow interaction on rotating stratified flows is, is, not, a, uh, is not a very saleable commodity. Um, and so I had to pretend to know something about something else. And uh, some guy says, well, you know, we, we want to model the thermohaline circulation. I said, oh, that's very, that's fascinating. I'm very interested in that. And he said, okay, well, well you, can, you, can, you can start. And I said, okay, great. And I put the phone down, and I remember asking my supervisor, so what's the thermohaline circulation again? <laughs> um, fake it till you make it. That's, that's, a, uh, that's a good motto. 
Uh, so I went to, uh, that was at McGill, and, uh, and I spent a very interesting three years at McGill. Uh, they were just starting off in the climate realm. Uh, they had been meteorologists and oceanographers, and then suddenly they're all in one department and they're doing climate. And they got a, uh, they got a grant to, uh, to bring in people to tell them about climate. Um, and they really hadn't much of a clue. Uh, and so that meant that they invited people from a whole wide range of, uh, of, of different disciplines and different topics and different time periods. And so it was a great uh, period to learn something about the climate system as a whole. And, and what were the kind of outstanding questions that, that you know, I might be able to add something into? Uh, so I did some modeling. Uh, you know, I did programming, and, uh, and I thought, oh, this, is, this is cool. Um, I did some work on the thermohaline circulation and its stability, and it seemed interesting, and people were interested. And I thought, oh, this is, this is, this is good. I could, I could be more interested. And you know, and the people that came through, they would talk about uh, proxy changes. So you know, what was going on in the ice cores, and how that told you about the variations in the last ice age, and what was going on in the ocean sediment, and how that told you about climate changes over millions of years, and what was going on in caves, and what was going on in in rainfall and hydrology. And, and I thought, oh, there's, there's a link here, and the, and the link that that I saw was. Uh, water isotopes. So uh, ever since then, I've been thinking, wow, oh, water isotopes, they're cool. They, they fit into everything. And, and so that was, that was not really my idea. It was, it was uh, an idea that um, John Juzel had had here back in the 1980s, uh, where uh, the GIST model was, I think, was the second model to have water isotope traces in the, uh, in the atmosphere. Um, I, people in France have been thinking about water isotope traces, but nobody had actually put water isotope traces in a couple boil where you could see what the impact uh, on the ocean sediment and the ice cores and the caves was all at the same time. And uh, I thought, okay, well that's a good idea. That could be my idea. Right? So that, that's, uh, let's see if we can if we can do that. So I, I couldn't do that at, at McGill that they didn't have. Uh, I didn't have a, uh, a GCM, and um, uh, and then in the end, actually, I wrote a, I wrote a proposal with uh, Joachim Morotsky uh, to to work on adjoint models instead. So uh, the idea there is you take a model um, and you linearize it, and by linearizing it, you can make it go faster, find equilibria uh, in a very very uh, quick way, and so you wouldn't have to run an ocean model for thousands of years, you could just go ding, 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 boof, and you'd find the, uh, the equilibrium. And in simple models, that works very well. And the adjoint and the tangent linear model works very well for you know, data assimilation. So I wrote a proposal uh, to look at that with Joachim Morotsky uh, to work at MIT. Um, but the program that I was doing that with was this uh, NOAA program on climate and uh, uh, NOAA climate and global change postdocs. Uh, but it turns out that they, they come to a pretty arbitrary decision that they've given too much money to, uh, to MIT in the recent past. So I could have the money, but I couldn't go to MIT. So I said, well, where else can I go? And they said, well, just find somewhere. And I go, well, but I won't be able to do that work on the adjunct model. It doesn't matter, just do something vaguely related. <laughs> and I look back at that and I think, how did that happen? <laughs> How do you just like give somebody like you know two years worth of money and just tell them to go off and do something interesting, right? So I I, I find I, I find that I was very lucky um, in 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 giving in getting that, uh, and I was lucky in in another respect because I had a uh, a girlfriend who was currently who was living in New York at the time. Uh, that's not why I was lucky. <laughs> uh, but I, when I came to New York, and I said, "Well, maybe I'll just find somewhere in New York." And so I went to all the places in New York. I went to uh, I went to Lamont. Uh, I went to uh, NYU. I think I went to Princeton, and I came here. And basically, I said, "Hi, I think I'm interesting, and you don't have to pay me for two years. What would you like me to do?" <laughs> Um, oddly enough, uh, 
Lamont, the people there, only wanted me to work on some like tiny little specific thing that they really, really, really cared deeply about. But it was so monumentally uh, interesting that I can't recall what it was uh, now. A GFDL, uh, nobody had the time of day uh, to, to visit with a, with a postdoc who, who hadn't made uh, an appointment very far in advance. And everybody was too busy, sorry. Uh, and I came here, and I spent time talking to David, who had, like, who I, I read a few of his papers, um, and, I, and I talked to him about the Cretaceous and ocean heat transport and uh, water isotope traces and the work of Jean Jussel and how interesting it might be to do that and how that would tie in with this and that. And then we talked about this and I talked to Mark Chandler and we went for a beer. The beer was crucial. Uh, <laughs> it still is, but, but at that particular point it was. And I, and I came back from, from that discussion thinking, huh, this is an interesting place to be. People are open to interesting ideas. People have the time to talk to people about their interesting ideas. And they're not so <laughs> and, they're, and they're not so kind of focused on their one or two specific issues that they can't think a little bit outside the box. Now that wasn't that wasn't a that wasn't a uh, representative survey of everybody in the building, obviously, at the time. Uh, but, but my interaction was, it, it was unique in all, all of the interviews that I'd had when I was looking for a job. That, that, was, that was a unique interaction that I had. And, and I think, again, I was, uh, for the second time, extremely lucky to have had that interaction. So I ended up coming here. Uh, and uh, people who were here then might recall the state of the modeling enterprise. Um, it was a many hydra, hydra headed beast, many headed beasts, like a hydra. What year was this? This was in 96. Um, everybody had their own version of the model. They were all nominally the same model, but none of them were. Um, Gary had his own completely different version of the model that people kind of talked about as if it's the same model, but it wasn't. Um, Tony had his version. Uh, uh, David has his version. Jim was using yet another version, and the uh, and the competent programmers who, who some of whom are still here, Jeff and and Rado and Gene pretty much spent all of their time just trying to kind of zigzag between the things and not really making very much progress, but just fixing the errors that various people had found in various rundowns. Uh, we had, uh, at the time, a, uh, a very uh, innovative, uh, but not the most flexible uh, version control system uh, in the world, uh, which, was, uh, which was very neat. And people were, were still using uh, a, a full screen editor that actually we'd written here in the building, uh, presumably it was, on, it was on one of the first first ABMs, right? Um, we were no longer using punch cards, for which I'm also <laughs> quite grateful. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I came in and my first, my first thought was, I am gonna do water isotopes in a couple more, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and so, uh, it turns out that we didn't have a couple model. <laughs> um, we had a couple. We had Gary's couple model, but 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 that didn't have any tracers. The tracers were in David's version of the model, but that wasn't the same as Tony's version of the model, which had the interesting cloud processes which were needed to work out water isotopes. And so there were all these bits. So I thought, well, we could just bring those together. We just it's like I'm just going to take that code and make it all into one piece of code. Uh, and then I'll be able to do water isotopes in a couple of them. And um, needless to say, that wasn't that wasn't very straightforward. Um, and it took a long time to bring all the different elements, uh, put everything together, change the version control system, uh, deal with all of the other issues that people had been complaining about for the last uh, for the previous 10 years, 
rewrite the code, give it a new name, um, uh, put it together, test it. So basically, we didn't do any of the water isotope stuff until uh, it would have been about nine years after I started. <laughs> <laughs> but all the time, it was there in my mind that this is what we were trying to do. But then once it was done, once we'd created Model E, and once everybody was much happier with the state of the code, once we were all actually working on the same model together again, then like you know, like that whole kind of investment in the collective uh, allowed me space to to do the kind of weird dash shit that I was doing with water isotopes and paleo. And we, we've written some great papers. We wrote some papers on the April 2 Killier event, which nobody else in the building cared about, um, on, uh, on uh, changes in uh, salinity during the, the mid-Holocene and, and how the data was being misinterpreted because they didn't take into account the changes in the, in the isotopes, uh, trying to understand what's, what, the, uh, what, the, um, what the caves in China are telling us about monsoonal changes over... Uh, over you know hundreds of thousands of years, some really interesting stuff which most people here don't care about. And I think that that is the interesting connection, right? We're not a very hierarchical organization, right? This is uh, if you go visit the Hadley Center, right? There are tiers, there are teams. Everybody is told what to do, and everybody does exactly what they're told. It's very productive as long as the people at the top tell people to do things that are good. And they focus on the things that they can do uh, very well. But in terms of, let me do this, let me be interested in something else, that almost never happens. Uh, NCAR has a different model again. But, it, but again, they're the people that code and the people that bring up ideas, it's all very hierarchical. And the ability to go off reservation is very limited. GFDL, slightly better, but still quite limited. And so I look at my own path at GIS, and I look at the high profile stuff that other people here have been involved in. And to a large extent, I see the same pattern. I see this kind of like, the, the people that thrive here are almost always wearing two hats. There's one hat that says, I'm here because we have a collective effort that allows us to do interesting science collectively. But I'm also here because there's space for me to pursue my completely irrelevant and uninteresting to everybody else idea, and who knows, that might turn into something interesting. I think the greatest, the best example is Drew. But Drew came in as a physical chemist who was working on ozone uh, issues, and in doing so, started to think about the impact of climate change on uh, the ozone hole, and how that might affect the recovery of the ozone. When that started, it was a minor variation on one of David's models that had been developed for something else entirely. Nobody really cared except for him. That branched off into a full stratospheric chemistry. It branched off into full tropospheric chemistry. And now we are at the forefront of groups who can do um, full assessments of climate and air pollution and public health and uh, agricultural uh, impacts on a whole suite of interesting uh, policy specific scenarios uh, that Drew has been so successful he's, he's left. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it started because there was a framework, he had an interesting idea and it kind of ballooned. Right? A lot of you are here who are working on the aerosol component that comes from those that beginning. Right? Uh, the interest that some people have in modeling Mars. Okay, that's interesting, but it's not our bread and butter. But we have time to do that. We have time to have interesting conversations about 
what is the nature of a calendar and how should you code it so that it works wherever you want to be in the universe, right? That's an interesting conversation, but it's not a conversation that you have if everything is top-down, hierarchical, and everybody knows exactly what they're, they're supposed to be doing at every moment, right? The, uh, the, 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 I'll, I'll give one, one more example, that Ron remembers, I'm sure. So uh, my first nature paper uh, was about uh, the impact of greenhouse gases on the annular modes, right? So the, 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 the zonal mean flow in the, in the northern hemisphere. And that, uh, that came about because Ron was printing out some results from his model uh, on these modes and not seeing anything. I was printing out a result from Drew's model that he'd built to do the stratospheric ozone uh, test where we saw this really big result and we met at the printer and he had a picture that looked very much like my picture except that I had a result on my picture and he did not have a result on his picture and we thought no that's interesting I wonder what that could be about and then from that we wrote a couple of papers we cut we started a session and then like it became a whole thing there was a little cottage industry on uh, how forcing this impact modes of natural variability that continues to this day and that was a very interesting thing. And it was, again, something that came about because of random things that people were interested in that were not central to what it is that we were supposed to be doing, that were not in the five-year plan, but that we had space to develop and space to find interest. And so going forward, right, oh, I, is it, are we still do we still have that culture? Right? Do we still have a, uh, an environment here where people feel that there is something that needs to be done for the collective, that you, know, you need to do your bit of debugging, you need to do your bit of modularization, you need to do your bit of increased resolution and the rest of it. But do we still have that space to explore completely wild and wacky ideas that you don't think anybody else is going to be interested in? Yeah, that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. I didn't really expect an answer. The answer is, I think, I, to me, I think the answer is yes. And I, I think, you know, both as PI on modeling and as director of the institution, which is weird to say, I, I'm quite good at that. I, I, I think it's t to some extent, you know, when Jim was here, you know, he had that very laissez faire attitude, um, which basically encouraged everybody to just kind of fend for themselves. Um, perhaps a little bit too much. Uh, I'm not quite as laissez faire as, as Jim was. Um, but I still think that we have to maintain that balance, we have to maintain the space for people to explore interests and applications that they're never going to be able to convince anybody else in this room are interested. That doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter that nobody else here cares. It matters whether it's an interesting question that other people outside of the building are going to care about. Because when I look back at all of those different weird ideas that turned into something really fundamental and then kind of came back into uh, kind of the collective effort that we're putting in. They pay dividends, right? You know, it, building a model and doing this is not a mechanical engineering task where we would end up with exactly the same model regardless of the interests of all the people here. It's very much contingent on the questions that each of you individually have, have the efforts that each of you individually have put in, uh, and the fact that this whole paradigm works. And I think that's very, very powerful. Uh, and, you know, and I look at, I look at other places, uh, take NCAR, but let, let me go back to water isotopes, because that was my thing. So people put water isotopes into the atmospheric version of the NCAR model five times. 
but every time they did it, it was done at such a low level that it was completely orphaned the minute that it was finished. And so it never got used for anything. Right? To this day, they do not have a coupled water isotope simulation that allows them to answer the same kinds of questions that I and Allegro were answering uh, and, and looking at over a decade ago. Right? Uh, there's lots of other examples, like the aerosol stuff that we're working on, the, uh, the interactions between emissions and, and climate. Uh, a lot of these things, we are way ahead of other groups because we're not working to a very rigid plan that somebody thought of 10 years ago. Right? Where people see there's an interesting question, we work on it. When people said, hey, maybe we can do this exoplanet thing, lots of people volunteered to work on that, right? Regardless of the fact that they weren't actually being paid to do that for the most part. Ideas are what drive where we want to go, right? And having a diversity of ideas, because we're all different, we all have very different backgrounds, and we all have very different interests, and we all find lots of other things and diversity fascinating. It's that diversity of ideas that allows us to make progress for doing that. But it isn't just enough to, to be diverse. It's not just enough to, to have uh, lots of different ideas and lots of different individuals. The fact that we have a collective effort to maintain a model, to build a model, to make it better, to make it answer more interesting questions at each iteration, that kind of brings it in, right? So we go out and it comes back in. And that, that's the key to why I think this is such an interesting place to be. Now, it's not for everybody, right? There are people who work much more happily in a situation where they're always being told what to work on and they don't have to think uh, too independently and they don't need to worry too much about that. You know, that's fine. I would suggest that they get a job at the Hadley Center and they're going to be very, very happy. There are other people who can't ever bear to work with a group of people and to deal with all the messy compromises that have to happen when you have more than one person in a room making decisions. Again, they're going to be much happier in a university department working on their own stuff on their own. But, and I think it's most people here, where you have both of those elements, you know, the understanding that we either swim together or we sink together, but then with that extra time for you to pursue your own interests, then this is a really great place to be because people will respect the fact that your ideas are of interest to other people. And it can be that your work on some obscure piece of paleoclimate, like mine was, actually ends up in the model where it affects the atmospheric chemistry and it affects the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the hydrology. And it turns out that now there's a satellite that measures these exact things. And now we have all of that mecha mechanisms within the model and we can just do it straight away uh, without having to think about doing that from scratch. Because all of the elements that came about because of completely random things and uh, that were not thought about were in place to do something interesting. And so going forward, how do we maintain that? Right? So I think by recognizing that that is a culture, right? by recognizing that individually we can do that, right? to let ourselves be imaginative and creative about the ideas that we pursue. To, to think about the things that we do in terms of building infrastructure that will enable more and better science to be done uh, later on by people who perhaps you don't even know. And by rewarding that kind of creative thinking. By making it clear that it doesn't matter if you kind of go off the reservation for a while and work on something. As long as you come back. As long as that stuff kind of gets uh, gets embedded in our kind of collective code DNA thing, right? That 
Th those are the two elements. You have to be free to think that you can be creative, and you need to know that that creativity can be kind of encompassed in the collective effort that we're making. And that's something that I am totally committed to enabling as much as I can. And if my little random meander and totally unprepared remarks here <laughs> uh, have shown, um, it is possible to do that and have a successful career. And yeah, so go to it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
spending time in the day's office until nine in the evening and talking about existential issues mostly and then climate. <laughs> <laughs> I skip the existential stuff. It's <laughs> definitely something that is attracted us all here and kept us here. But speaking of the Paris organization, there appears to be an impression that headquarters, uh, I'm not going to call it a misconception, that uh, we're doing or supposed to be doing observations-based modeling. Uh, they, they want this to be doing more than Yeah. Uh, Constantine seems to have mentioned it to me in private conversations and I saw it. He, uh, he said it, yes, in that letter. And uh, I mean, there's good things and bad things about that. Uh, good things is that we could be doing an observation-based modeling because we have the, the expertise in the building on, on both sides of the aisle, uh, much more than many other places do. Mm -hmm. The question is, what exactly is observation-based modeling in the context of climate models? I mean, in anything up to seasonal and decadal forecasting, it's mostly a simulation, and that's kind of, you know, they can, you know, they're doing it at GMAO, and it's, right. it's obvious. The question is, what is observation-based modeling in the context of climate modeling? So I, I think you're right. It's a little ambiguous, which means that we can define it the way we want it to be defined. Yeah, and I think we have been in the process of trying to define it. I mean, we're involved with simulators and at the, the onset of the simulators to make observations-based modeling possible. Right. And we're involved in what's process-based diagnostic outputs and things like that now. Um, so in terms of you know, future uh, development, I think harnessing the uh, expertise of the building on both the observational and modeling uh, sides would be a good way for us to uh, so I, I, yeah. make a niche for ourselves yeah. in, in this. So I agree. I mean, like we, the the fact that we work for NASA means that there is a bias from our uh, our funders that we use as much of, Na of what NASA has to offer as possible, uh, unless it's talking to planetary science people, in which case we're not allowed to do that. <laughs> um, but I think observation-based science, <coughs> observation-based modeling, you know, can encompass a huge range of things. Obviously, it has nothing to do with predictions. Right, because there's no observations of the future, but I think that there's an, there's a big exception for that, so we can still do that. Um, but observation-based modeling can be reconciling different uh, estimates of what's going on from different observational views by way of model interpolation. Um, it can be uh, predictions of uh, emergent properties that will be seen in observational data sets. It can be uh, modeling that, um, uh, that, that takes uncertainties in the, uh, in the observational data and translates that into, into real uncertainties into, in, the, uh, in, the, in the processes and the, uh, and the mechanisms of change. Uh, so I think that there is uh, a lot of stuff that we can do. I mean, very little of what we do, it just kind of stands alone as a modeling exercise. I mean, almost every paper that we write, right? It's there's a model data, model observation comparison, and puzzle that we're trying to solve. Um, and you know, is this connected to this? Okay, well, it is here, but it's not there. What's the difference? What's the mechanism? And I think that that we can easily spin that into observational based modeling. Yeah. Uh, I think there's an opportunity for us to sort of define it a little better, right? Even in, in writing, in some sort, and, and turn it into our our own thing, our own niche, and you know, because I, I, I think that that's we're uh, on, our, on our way to do. Yeah. No, I yeah, just uh, I I agree. Yeah. Andy, well, if they want us to do observational based climate modeling, uh, do they? Uh, Understand that uh, we what we really need is good observations like uh, polarimetric measurements of aerosols. <laughs> We're required to use uh, existing uh, Modus Pfizer aerosols. I mean, aerosols in the climate model that can be screwed beyond belief. So the um, 
So that, that, that comes down to the fact that you know, the modeling that we do and our understanding of the measurements that need to be done have always been part and parcel of what we've done here. Right now, we've been unlucky with the perimeter uh, situation, but you know, we're still young, right? <laughs> yeah, and we've been doing quite a lot of uh, analysis on the uh, uh, modus visor aerosols, and uh, not all of that is well appreciated by people upstream there. Either. I mean. I mean, like, I, I, I mean, this is kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, but um, you know, I mean, like, the observations of the observation. I mean, like, we can't go back and make new observations of the past, right? So, you know, the observations that we have are what we have, and so you have to make the best of them. Now, the fact of the matter is that you know, things that people are saying are this observation actually turn out not to be that observation once you have a better understanding of what's actually being measured and what the processes are that are measuring it. And I think that that is a, a hugely important aspect of the modeling that we do, right? The forward modeling of the actual observations, um, whether it was for MSU data, uh, for MODIS, MISER, for, for CloudSat, for, uh, uh, for the ISKIP views, all of those things have totally changed our view of what those observations meant, right? And I think that that, that continues to be a big role for us. So, you know, you just got to keep plugging away at that. I mean, eventually people will get to the truth. Well, we hope so. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. I apologize for not having prepared anything, and I hope that it wasn't too uh, too painfully random. Anyway, thanks a lot. <laughs>